So URLs, the unsung universal. Everyone here knows what URLs are, right, Craig? Of course. Uh, <laughs> that's what makes them universal. So uh, I'm Matt with Hashemi. Uh, this is Financial. It's February 2017. Uh, the humble URL, as Urban Dictionary defined it recently, some long-ass link you are somehow supposed to fit in the address bar. Uh, <laughs> uh, I hear it's good to open with a definition. So URL stands for Universal Resource Locator. And uh, it's, it's, it's a very practical thing. Uh, you see them on the sides of buses. I'm a fan of URLs because never has something so complex reached the lay people, like, you know, all the way down here at the bottom, you know? Walking around, you see them on buses, you see them in English, even though you're in China, right? Like, here they are, this very powerful, very practical thing that everyone knows about. Uh, and yet, we really don't think about them that much. You know, we just sort of just like uh, read things off to other people, write them on bar napkins, they're very practical things. They're also used for stupid things, like they put uh, riddles on billboards in Silicon Valley that lead to Google job applications, you know. Uh, and maybe if uh, they had written in there a correct implementation of RFC 3986, then we wouldn't have, uh, you know, <laughs> people so good at math and not really knowing practical engineering. All right. Uh, so, yeah, the humble URL uh, has a history that is long.com. You know, have you ever heard this this uh, this phrasing, this slang? It's entered our slang. Bomb.com, long.com. Okay. Uh, yeah, they date back all the way to 1992, where they were known as W3 hypertext names. So the remainder of my talk will just be me explaining to you uh, what each of these RFCs did in the year that they no. It won't be that. <laughs> but we're talking about hundreds upon hundreds of pages uh, written over the course of decades uh, and rewritten and re-edited and really worked on by hundreds of people. And it's all for that little string, bomb.com. All right. Uh, so the ones that, uh, by the way, stick out are 1738 and uh, 2396. And 3986 came out in 2005. This is the gold standard URL specification. It has grammars in it. It has precise definitions. It's quite long, but it has ASCII art, and it has lots of examples, and lots of good things went into this RFC. Uh, <laughs> some other ones came out since then. The, the What WG document, uh, which uh, is on GitHub, it's a living document. It's sort of a standard, but it's a living document. This is, I, if this is the gold standard, then this is the browser Bitcoin. You know, this is uh, basically a standard written specifically for uh, hypertext applications, meaning web browsers, web hypertext application, something working group, technology working group, I guess. Yeah, it's kind of a very specific thing. It only talks about, it only calls out three types of URLs in particular, HTTP and something and Gopher. In 2017, what was the other one? HTTP, FTP, and Gopher in 2017. And these are the only special schemes that it considers. It's very strange. So why is the history of the URL so long? Part of it is because the humble URL is actually not so humble. <laughs> Even though it's found everywhere, for years it was obsessed with finding everything. The universality wasn't about where it was available. The universality is what it was trying to name. So you ended up with this thing that are URNs, URIs, IRIs, URLs, a list of things you don't want your doctors telling you you got, right? Uh, <laughs> but uh, what do you call it? Like who, who, uh, who here like you know has heard these phrases? Like who you, you know about IRIs, URNs? Can you tell me what the difference is? In fact, even like the W3 struggled with uh, people uh, having this. So they, they created a URI clarification document uh, that, you know, like I can summarize for you right here. I've enhanced it. Uh, you know, <laughs> it says confusion. And uh, this was very confusing for folks. And they wanted basically to have, uh, you know, resources that were books. And so you would have an ISBN URN. You'd be able to identify a, uh, a book through its ISBN, which was actually a subset of URI uh, because it was a URN or something like that. This is very confusing, right? We all know what URLs are and they, don't, they aren't books, you know? So let's talk about what are URLs. 
URLs are something that we can come to know. They are something we can come to use uh, knowledgeably. And uh, all it takes is a reasonable amount of knowledge. So here's a little bit of ASCII art that's actually from uh, Wikipedia. So uh, it splits up a full URL. This is a URL that uses all of its parts. It's a very healthy, full-bodied URL. So uh, it starts out with the scheme. Then you have some user information. Then you have a host. And then you have a port. Then you have your query string. And then you have your fragment. You know? This part could be called authority. That part could be called the path. It's it's a it's a really it's a really like very advanced thing for something that we just go around to saying bomb.com, and uh, all these different parts have their own delimiters that sort of separate them. So the scheme ends at a colon, right? And the path starts at the first slash. Or if there's not an authority, then it starts right after the scheme. And so this thing that is just a string, it's just a string, actually has uh, like half a dozen encodings inside of it. What we call URL encoding, there's an encoding for here, 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 there's an you know, there's an encoding for here. <laughs> so uh, URL encoding is actually something very complex. We, it's something we used to see like, oh, there are percents in there, there are pluses in there. But contextually, where it is in the string really determines what encoding is used. So. I, I, you know, I could make a slide for every single one of these parts, but I think that it was easier probably to go by example. So you've probably heard of this website, googlewebsite.com, you know, uh, eshops.aspx. I'm pretty sure that's like a real site that you can visit. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's pretty straightforward. That We're back. We're not looking at this anymore. We're looking at, oh, that's a cool thing. Uh, yeah, we're looking at this, something that's nice and approachable. So, uh, you know, you have, an, you, you have the port and you have a query string and it's nothing special. It's something that you're familiar with. You feel comfortable with this, even though the space has been turned into its ASCII uh, value right here with a percent sign because the space isn't valid in that, in that part of a URL. It's easy. Ooh, let's look at these examples. These ones, these are really weird domains to register, you know? Like, the, like, I don't know who thought this would be good SEO to get these domains. Uh, <laughs> XN-BCHER dash. This is a little bit weird, right? Now, as it turns out, this is, this is totally valid and is actually how Unicode looks when you put it in a domain name. Remember I said there are all these different encodings for different parts? Uh, this is IDNA encoding. This is uh, also, like, goes under sort of the very cute name Punicode. You know, it's even smaller than Unicode, it's puny. And so uh, what is happening is this U uh, right here with the umlaut or the diuresis gets popped out and all of the ASCII parts go here and then some binary encoding of where that was goes over here. And the XN dash dash is how you know that it is uh, this puny coded thing. And then when you uh, pass it to say, a, a fictional very excellent library here uh, that is definitely not a screenshot of its tests, uh, <laughs> you know, it, it can either look like this when it's fully encoded, or it looks like this when it's an IRI, when it's a decoded thing that you're looking at in your address bar. Remember that long ass link that you put in your address bar? Here's what it looks like when you paste it in. You know, here's what it looks like when it sends it over the wire. Not too bad. Let's look at some more examples. So, HTTP is not the only thing. Sorry, what, wugga. <laughs> you know, like there's SSH. SSH is a, is a protocol that we know and love. Uh, there's an IP. There's a port. You know, uh, sometimes, this is a very interesting one here. Why am I doing that with a pointing? Uh, this right here is sort of a uh, emerging, like, sort of convention. Uh, have you ever seen this before when you do pip install dash E or something like that? You do a plus here sort of indicates that uh, the HTTPS is the transport, but Git is the real protocol that I'm going after there. Now, you're also probably looking at this, and you're like, oh my god, that's an IPv6 with an IPv4 embedded. And the way that you indicate that is you put the square brackets around it, because otherwise the colons would interfere with that colon there. That's also part of RFC 396. Yeah. So uh, LDAP is another one, same IPv4 trick inside the IPv6, except over here in the path, we got this really interesting case of, uh, you know, something. 
right? Some query string for LDAP. This is a really interesting one, mail to. Did you know that mail to is a URL? Like you probably didn't think of it, but look at that colon. Now you know it is, right? And this part right here, it's not user info. This is actually the path. Because there was no authority, this is a relative path that has an at sign in it, and that's fine. At signs are okay in the query string. Nice. So, <laughs> wish I was that guy. Uh, all right. So uh, now, one interesting thing that I struggled with a lot, and the reason I got involved with what will go in the first place, is because of this. Look at this. How do you know that there should be this unhappy face? You know, with the sad sort of, you know, kind of disappointed uh, thing. How do you know that it should be this or just or just the colon? How do you know it should be this or just the colon? And that is purely determined based on the scheme. You know, mail to never has a network location, whereas LDAP does, or SSH does. Tell never has a network scheme, because you know that the network is actually you pressing your finger and some buttons, or a touch screen. Uh, news never, uh, or maybe it does. I don't know, I don't know news very well. You're using that guy. <laughs> he, yeah, he's he's alt dot uh, alt dot Mark Williams. Uh, okay, so yeah, uh, URNs right here. Never have a network name, so there's never th these slashes are just determined based on that. I learned that. Okay, this one is Granddaddy URL right here, Magnet URL. This is everything you need to download Puppy Linux. It's totally legal. You thought I put something illegal up there? We should get out of here. All right. Magnet links are used for, uh, you know, um, torrents. And they're, they're really handy. Look how much information you can store in there. So what, what I want, uh, you know, I don't expect you to memorize all these different things. There's tons of RFCs. There's RFCs for every single scheme. And all of these sort of generalities emerged after everyone was sort of asking for their features in the URL, I think. So... Uh, I want you to know that URLs are powerful, right? That basically, uh, you know, I mean, what is this? This isn't a URL. I'll show you something. So we def func with an argument one, argument two, keyword argument equals none, something, right? We want to use that function from package.module, import func, func arg1, arg2, keyword arg, eh, awesome, right? This is awesome. This is a Python call. We all know that Python has a very sort of full-featured, uh, you know, powerful calling scheme, you know? And I want to say that this, theoretically, could go into a URL. <laughs> I just made this up. This isn't a real scheme. But imagine there was a PY scheme. Now you know you're running Python, because I made it Python, so I was writing it right back there. Uh, you know, here's the authority, right? Now we do it sort of backwards. It's not com dot. Java dot. <laughs> Anyways, it's it's func dot module dot package, right? Here's the function. It's the most local part. There's a module. There's a package. We put our positional arguments in the path. Then we have our query string, which has the keyword arguments, and uh, you know, have a little comment in there. Power. Awesome. So I think that URLs are great. I think that URLs are very powerful, and uh, the reason I think this is because uh, I spent quite a lot of time writing a thing called URL utils that lives in my boltons package. Uh, it's a mutable representation of a URL. Those are the tests I was showing you earlier that it passes. Uh, I'm doing an immutable version of it that's actually derived from the twisted code base. So for years, I struggled with some of these tests not passing. Some corner of the RFC I forgot to implement. And I looked at twisted, and there was this really mature URL just sitting there that didn't support IPv6 and a few other things. So I said, OK. I'll extend it with Glyph's blessing. We're splitting it out into a separate package. Everyone will be able to partake from the beautiful, correct, immutable URL. And uh, you know, here's my contact info if you got questions. I'm also organizing another event if you're interested in data science and that sort of thing. Wikipedia Data Design Challenge 2017, March 4th and 5th. It's going to be lots of fun. If you enjoyed this talk, I think you'll really enjoy that too. Sure. So uh, this is the scheme. It's HTTP. And in the path, <laughs> uh, no, uh, Wikipedia Data Design Challenge. There's no relation to this, except that I'm organizing that, too. And that's one of the reasons why this was such a rushed presentation and I was so harried. But uh, hopefully, you guys have learned something about URLs. If you have questions, I'm no RFC, but I can do my best to answer them. Hugh's got a question. Well, let's get him a mic. 
run, Mark. Just throw it with your football arm. The reason why you got into coding. <laughs> So I have a question about um, are non-alphanumeric uh, characters supported in URLs? So for example, can you type in a link with like Russian alphabet characters? Yeah, definitely. Like so uh, Python. So it's not. It's not just. Uh, let's go back to some of my examples here. So uh, right here, right? Like here's a Unicode character right there, and uh, you know there are. Even you're even allowed to put in characters that don't have a specific uh, encoding. You can put in binary data into URLs. It's really not recommended, uh, but it's technically possible. If it doesn't decode, decode, it's assumed to be binary and it's left untouched. And you can you know interpret it as a struct if you'd like. It's not very efficient. I recommend base 64 in binary data before putting it in URLs that you send to Moshe. So, uh, <laughs> anyways. Uh, yeah, so you can put in any data you want into a URL, especially in that sort of path and query string part. Another question. <laughs> <laughs> this is working well. So and just to add on to that, I know someone that has a subdomain on their website where it's all emojis. Yeah, there's like a so there's like an emoji totally snowman.com, you know, that, that sort of thing. Uh, and I mean, that's an expensive joke to make, you know. If it, a subdomain is not bad, but registering the top-level domain or whatever, yeah. Asher has a question. Hey, uh, Mabu, uh, related question. You mentioned that there's more than one uh, escaping or encoding scheme, and of course, there's the scheme we all know on the um, right-hand side of the URL. And I guess Punicode counts as a second escaping scheme in a way. Um, were you saying that the query parameters have a different escaping scheme from the do we call it the fragment, the part on the left side of the question mark? Yeah, so it's, uh, so, it's so basically it's not technically a completely separate scheme. Uh, it's it's uh, just a variation, you know, which might as well be a different one. It's just different special characters that will have to be encoded for every single part. Because, for instance, in the scheme, you can't have uh, a colon, right? And in the if you want a, um, a question mark in the path, then you need to encode that. But you wouldn't need to encode that question mark if it was already in the query string or something like that. So this is the the min the minimum that needs to be encoded. But you can you can encode everything, right? You can encode the you question can, marks, yeah, except yeah. where it's functional in a right. You can you can encode every single character except for unreserved characters, I think. I'm not even sure if you encode res unreserved characters if it just works or not. Yeah. So what about the what about the protocol? Let's uh, say instead of SSH, it was you know snowman emoji colon oh, you, slash. Oh, you slash. mean oh, you mean the scheme? Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, like I said, I'm not an RFC, but I do have a parser that I can like pull up and I can tell you if it's valid or not, and we can of course run it through the library and see if it complains. But I think that you could put anything you want in there. So would Punicode apply there, or would we use the so-called <sighs> URL encoding? Just trying to quiz me. <laughs> uh, let's see. Would Punicode like be used in the scheme? I don't think so because Punicode is for DNS. Okay. Punicode is for DNS. You're not going to send the scheme over DNS. So it would either be invalid or it would be percent encoded. Cool. It is very cool. Thank you, Asher, for the questions. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh yeah, I mean the so the announcements I guess are coming up if there's no more questions about URLs. But uh, yeah, thanks for having me.